Side three. Barney was up the elm tree that grew very close to grandfather's house. It had a swing on one of the lower branches and near the top there was a hole where the jackdaws usually made a nest each year. Barney had climbed up to see how they were getting on this spring and they'd already laid one egg. He climbed higher. He could see the house almost below him and the garden with daffodils and crocuses showing and the wood and copses where the trees still showed their bones but were beginning to cover them with new green leaves. He heard Lou's voice calling for him but he didn't answer. I bet she can't find me, he thought and grinned to himself. Then he saw his grandmother and Lou in the yard going out to the car with shopping baskets. They got into the car and drove off. He'd rather be up a tree in the wind than go shopping. He could see ploughed fields with a tractor crawling over the bare earth pulling a harrow. He could see black and white cows on the pasture. He could see a big black car coming in along the lane towards the house. That was funny. It had stopped and pulled off the road into the copse near the chalk pit. He could see two men get out and walk towards the house. They wore dark hats and mackintoshes and didn't look like country people. Had he seen them before? Yes, he had. They had come to the door once before and he had answered the doorbell. They'd asked him if his grandmother had got any silver or jewels to sell and he had told them that of course grandmother had lots of silver and jewels but he didn't think she would want to sell them as she'd got some money already. And then grandmother had come out and told them she didn't want to sell anything, thank you, and if she did, she wouldn't sell it on the doorstep and she'd seemed quite cross. And now the men were coming back again. Well, there was nobody at home, and he was going to stay in his tree. One of the men stayed in the lane, and the other went and knocked on the door. The man knocked again and waited a long time. Then he went round to the back door and tried that. It wasn't locked. The man looked about him, opened the door, and went in. Barney's heart fluttered. That man had gone into Granny's house when he shouldn't have. He must be a thief. He'd take all the silver and drive off with it in his car. And Barney was all alone up in the tree and there was no one who could help in time. Yes, there was. Barney started climbing down, trying not to be too shaky and excited. He slipped and slithered the last bit and then ran as fast as he could towards the copse. By the time he'd got to Stig's cave, he was quite out of breath. Stig was there all right. He was sticking arrowheads onto their shafts and binding them with cat gut, which he was taking from a broken old tennis racket. He looked all ready for the spring hunting season. <sighs> Stig, puffed Barney, you've got to help. A man's got into Granny's house and I'm sure he's a thief and he'll take all the silver and jewels and even my money box if he finds it. What are we going to do, Stig? Stig just grinned in a friendly way and Barney began to feel hopeless. It was just like when he was trying to explain about Stig to the grown-ups. They just smiled and said, really? And of course Stig didn't speak English. He didn't talk at all much, but he must make him understand. Enemy, said Barney fiercely, pointing to the top of the cliff. Bad men, he said, screwing up his face to look wicked. Fight em, Stig, shoot em. See em off, Stig, he urged, making bow and arrow movements and spear movements with his arms. Stig seemed to get the idea. He grinned more than ever and scowled horribly at the same time. Barney picked up the bow and arrows and handed them to Stig, but Stig gave them back to him and took the club instead. They ran out of the far end of the pit and Barney led the way round into the lane and up the hill towards the house. There at the top, where the lane passed near the chalk cliff and there was a gap where lorries backed off the road to dump things over the cliff, they found the big black car parked. And coming along the lane were the two men carrying a large suitcase each. Without thinking, Barney fitted an arrow into the bow and shot it. A dark city hat flipped off the head of one of the men and was pinned to the bank of the lane by a flint-tipped arrow. The men stopped. Then they saw Barney. Now then, kid, said the man, cut it out. That's dangerous playing with bows and arrows. 
You're thieves, said Barney. You've got Granny's silver in that suitcase. The man looked at his companion. Look, Sonny, we come to look at your Granny's television, didn't we, Sidney? We got our tools in these here cases, haven't we, Sidney? That's right, said Sidney. Plucky little nipper, though, ain't he, Sidney? Barney was beginning to feel foolish, and he lowered his bow, which he was pointing at the man with another arrow fitted. The man turned round for his hat. He pulled the arrow out, then he looked at the sharp flint tip, and his face went white. You little horror! He snarled. Where'd you get them things from, eh? You know you might have killed me. He broke the arrow across twice and threw the pieces angrily on the ground. Come on, hand over the rest of them things, or there'll be trouble. He came towards Barney with a very nasty expression on his face. Stig had been lurking behind the car. When he saw the man break his precious arrow and come angrily towards Barney, he let out a sound between a growl and a howl and dashed at the man, raising his horrible club. The two men took one look at this wild figure, dropped their suitcases and ran, with Stig in mad pursuit and Barney running after Stig. Stig, come back! shouted Barney. It's all a mistake. They're not bad men. They're not thieves. They came to mend the television. But it was no use. What did Stig know about television? There was a barbed wire fence at the top of the lane. As the second man scrambled over, his raincoat got caught. In a panic, he struggled out of the coat and ran off over the field, leaving it on the fence. It was this that saved him, because Stig stopped to look at the coat, as if he wasn't quite sure what part of himself the man had left behind. Barney caught up with him and took hold of his arm. Stig, you mustn't chase those men, Barney panted. I thought they were thieves, but they're not. But Stig was looking at the coat. As he turned it about, a whole lot of shining things fell out of a pocket onto the ground. Stig picked them up and admired them, turning them to the light. No, Stig, said Barney. You can't have them. They're only the man's teaspoons. I expect he was going to have a picnic. Hey, just a minute. Barney pulled Stig by the arm. We'd better look at those suitcases. They ran back down the lane, and Barney opened one of them. Golly, he exclaimed. All Granny's spoons and forks, and her jewels and cufflinks belonging to Grandfather, and his own money box. So they were thieves after all. What should he do now? They might come back to their car any time and drive away. He ran to the car, opened the rear door and looked inside. Under some sacks were more suitcases and bags that clanked when he felt them. Loot from other people's houses. Barney sat in the front seat and held the steering wheel. If only he could drive, he could take the car to the police. He took off the handbrake. At least he knew how to do that. The car began to roll backwards towards the edge of the pit. Barney scrambled out with the car still moving. There was a lurch as first one back wheel, then another went over the edge. The front wheels rose slowly in the air and with a horrible scraping and grinding the whole car slid over the edge. There seemed to be quite a long time before Barney heard the crash as the car hit the bottom of the dump. But he felt too sick to look. When he opened his eyes, he saw Stig looking over the edge of the cliff, waving and pointing and grinning all over his face as if it were some great animal they just hunted over the cliff and he was looking forward to cutting up the meat. Then he was running off round the pit to get to the bottom. Barney hid the suitcases deep in a bramble patch before running off after Stig again. By the time he got to the car, which was lying on its back, Stig was already hard at work skinning the leather off the seats and the carpets off the floors. Barney stood helplessly watching. Stig obviously thought that anything thrown into his dump was for him to do what he liked with. But if the men came back, they'd be very angry. Then he saw what they'd have to do. He got up on the pile of rubbish at the foot of the cliff and started throwing things on top of the dead motor car. Old wash tubs, bedsteads, bicycle frames. Stig soon got the idea. They were burying the animal to hide it from the enemy. 
Before long, the car was covered. Then as they worked, Stig suddenly froze into stillness and listened. Barney listened too. The voices of the two men came down from the top of the cliff. Well, it ain't there, is it? Go on, have a good look. All right then, it's gone. What do we do now? We got a nice long walk, that's what we've got, mate. Got windy because a couple of kids was playing Red Indians, so we lost a lot all through you. They wasn't kids, one wasn't anyways. What was it then? It was a thing, I tell you, an horrible thing. Out of that there pit, I shouldn't wonder. Come on, let's get out of here. I tell you, I don't like this place. I'm getting back to town if I have to walk all the way. Barney smiled at Stig as the voices faded away. Stig grinned and shook his horrible club. Granny and Lou were back from shopping when Barney struggled in through the front gate carrying the two heavy suitcases full of silver. Barney, what on earth have you been up to? Granny exclaimed. I've brought your spoons and forks back, Granny. You see, two men came to do the television. I mean, that's what they said, but they were thieves, really, and I was up the tree, but me and Stig chased them away, and I let their car go over into the chalk pit, and it's there now with all the treasure in it. Well, you have been having fun, said Granny. Now, let's have tea, shall we? Lay the table, Lou, and Barney, go and wash your hands. Lou started laying the table. Where are the teaspoons, Granny? she asked. In the usual place, I suppose, dear, said Granny from the kitchen. No, they're not, Granny, Barney said. They're hanging on the fence in Mr Tickle's field. Really, Barney, that's naughty. You know you mustn't take the silver for games. I didn't take them, Granny, Barney protested. It was the television man, and Stig was running after him with a club, and I tried to stop him because I thought he wasn't a thief. But he took his coat off and left it hanging on the fence, and the spoons fell out. I thought he was going to have a picnic at first, but then I knew they were yours. I'll go and fetch them. And he ran out. When Barney got back, there was a policeman at the door talking to Granny. What's this about thieves, Sonny? asked the policeman. Yes, I saw them. One of them went into the house and I went to fetch my friend Stig and me and Stig had a fight with them and they ran away and the teaspoons fell out and the car was full of treasure. The policeman scratched his head. Where might this car be? Barney stood on one leg. Well, I thought perhaps I could drive it to the police station but it went backwards over the cliff and Stig thought it was dead and started skinning it and then we buried it. The policeman looked hard at Barney. You wouldn't be making this up, would you, son? He asked sternly. I'm afraid my grandson has a very strong imagination, said Granny. But I'm telling the truth, Granny, said Barney. Perhaps the little boy would like to show me where this uh, alleged treasure is, ma'am, suggested the policeman. Barney led the way. It was getting dark now, and the policeman took a torch from his pocket. They clambered over the heap of rubbish, and Barney moved aside the branches that hid the door of the upturned car. In there. The policeman shone his torch inside. There was a terrible mess of ripped leather, broken glass from the windows, scattered stuffing from the seats, and bare springs. No sign of the treasure. The policeman sat down on an old wash tub and took his helmet off. Listen to me, young Barney, said the policeman. When I was a youngster, I used to play cops and robbers, and I can tell you it was a lot more exciting and a lot more fun than being a real copper. So I'm not blaming you, understand? You imagined you had a fight with two robbers, see? You imagined this bit of old junk was a car that went off the cliff. That's it, isn't it? It never really happened, eh? Barney stood there dumbly. Perhaps you could imagine fights with robbers and cars going over cliffs. Perhaps he just imagined Stig. He was looking miserably into the darkness of the pit and was just about to nod his head and agree with all the policeman was saying when he saw in the far corner of the pit a flicker of light. Stig's den. He scrubbed away some tears and said firmly, It did happen and I know where the treasure is. 
and he went scampering towards the den. He kicked cans and rattled old sheets of iron as much as he could. He wanted to give Stig warning that they were coming. He felt it would be too much trying to explain Stig to the policeman, even if Stig was there in front of his eyes. When he got to the entrance to the den, well ahead of the policeman, there was no sign of Stig inside. He stood by the entrance and waved the policeman in. The policeman crawled in through the low entrance. Then he gasped. It looked like Aladdin's cave. Necklaces and bracelets hung winking from the roof of the shelter. The floor of the cave was carpeted with the skin of the car seats. Stig's bed was made up with padding from the seats and covered with fur coats. And above it, stuck into the wall, was a driving mirror and a set of switches and buttons saying headlights and wiper. And all around the floor, stuck into the ground and set out like tin soldiers on parade, were troops of silver spoons and forks. Stig had been enjoying himself. Well, I'm blessed, exclaimed the policeman. He took out his notebook. I take it all back, Barney, me boy. And if you'll just help me tick off in my book all this stolen property, which someone has so kindly put out on parade for us, we'll get it back to its rightful owners all the quicker. And I shouldn't be surprised if there was a reward for a bright boy at the end of all this. Barney started to explain all over again what had happened, but the policeman said he'd had a tiring day and he'd rather not have any more explanations. But at that time, when he went home from his grandmother's house, he took a brand new bicycle with him. And Stig? Well, Stig was disappointed at not being allowed to keep all the treasure, but before he went, Barney found some spanners in the wreck of the car and he taught Stig how to use them. Stig was very proud of his necklace of steel nuts strung on wire cable and his bangles of piston rings. It was the Easter holiday. Barney and Lou were doing some painting in the dining room and Granny had spread some sheets of newspaper over the table in case they made a mess. Barney was reading the newspaper. Hey, look what it says here. Bottoms Mammoth Circus. Do you think we can go to it? Lou came round the table and looked at the advertisement. World's greatest travelling show, she read. Golly, Liberty Horses, Ranji and his elephants, daring wild animal act, opens at Maidsford April the 17th. That's next week. Come on, Barney, let's ask Granny if we can go. But when they bounced into the drawing room, their grandmother was sitting in a chair talking to a strange lady. Grandmother said... Come and say how do you do to Mrs. Forkham Green, children. They came in and shook hands. These are my grandchildren, Barney and Lou, explained Grandmother to the strange lady. They're staying with me for part of the holidays. Mmm, but how nice for you. I'm giving a fancy dress party for my niece on Wednesday. Do you think Barney and Lou would like to come? Most children nowadays seem to hate parties, but I think they're good for them, don't you? Oh, a fancy dress party, exclaimed Lou. I'll go as a puma. And I'll be a caveman, said Barney. And Granny, can we go to the circus too? It's next Monday, please, Granny. Now, 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 exclaimed Granny. We'll have to see, dears. When Mrs. Forkham Green left, Granny began to explain the difficulties of making fancy dress costumes with only a day and a half to do it in. Perhaps they could go to the circus instead of the party. The children went off rather gloomily. Barney stood by the window and thought. Then, without a word, he slipped out of the house. When he got to the den, he found Stig happily peeling an old umbrella somebody had thrown away down the pit. Barney put his hand into his pocket and took out a glass marble. I brought this for you, Stig, he said. Stig held it up to the light, grinned and put it in his mouth. No, no, Stig, it's not for eating. Spit it out, Stig! Stig took the marble out of his mouth and looked at Barney questioningly. It's just for playing with, explained Barney. Look, here's another. He rolled the second marble along the ground to Stig. Stig seemed amused at the way the little glass ball rolled around, flashing in the light. He rolled his marble at Barney's and they struck and bounced apart. He played with both of them for a bit and then handed them back to Barney. No, they're for you, Stig, said Barney. Stig put them carefully in a niche in the wall 
and then seemed to look about for something to give Barney in exchange. He picked up two or three of his precious umbrella bones and offered them to Barney, but Barney pushed them away. No, thank you. He had his eye on a pile of skins in the corner, and Stig seemed to notice this, for he went across to it and picked up a sort of apron of rabbit skin stitched together just like he wore himself. Barney's face lit up. Oh, thank you. There were a lot more skins in the pile. Barney squatted down and turned them over. There were mole skins, squirrel skins, things that looked like cat skins, and then he gave a gasp of surprise. Near the bottom was the skin of a great animal, head and all, and it was golden and spotted with black. A leopard. Barney dragged it out and goggled at it. Gosh, Stig, did you kill this? he asked. Stig grinned and shrugged his shoulders. He seemed to be willing that Barney should think he'd killed a leopard, but Barney was rather suspicious. He'd seen leopard skins like this worn by soldiers in military bands, and he had seen them on floors in people's houses. Perhaps someone had just thrown this one away. Anyway, there was the leopard skin, and Lou ought to be quite satisfied with it. But would Stig want to part with it? Barney felt in his pocket. He'd only spent two marbles so far, and he had quite a lot more. He took out two more and pointed at the leopard skin. Stig looked very doubtful. Barney added another marble. Stig still looked doubtful. Barney took two more marbles from his pocket. Now there were five. Suddenly Stig seemed to understand that Barney had quite a pocket full of marbles to spend. He held out both hands to Barney with all the fingers spread out. Ten. A leopard skin costs ten marbles, thought Barney. He put the first five marbles on the ground and counted out what was left in his pocket. Six, seven, eight, nine. There were three more. Here, you might as well have them all, said Barney, and handed over all twelve. Stig had been checking the marbles on his fingers while Barney counted. When he found he had more marbles than fingers, he was so delighted that he went to another corner of the cave and came back with a stone axe on a wooden handle and gave it to Barney with the skin. Barney was delighted too. Oh, Stig, thank you. We'll be able to go to the fancy dress party now. Goodbye. When he got back to the house, he had an idea. He took the bundles quietly to his own room, undressed, and got himself dressed in the rabbit skins. He looked at himself in the mirror and scowled fiercely. Bother. He didn't have nearly enough hair. He had another idea. He crept downstairs to the broom cupboard and took the head off a mop. When he tried it on his own head in front of the mirror, it looked just right. He took his axe in one hand and the leopard skin in the other and crept along the passage to his sister's room. He gave a whoop and charged into the room, waving his axe. Lou jumped like a startled cat and faced Barney furiously. You're not to frighten people, Barney. I'm not, Barney. I'm Stog, Stig's brother. And he did a war dance round the bedroom. Where have you been? asked Lou more calmly. Me? Me been hunting, said Barney. Look what I killed and he threw the leopard skin on the floor. Lou's eyes nearly popped out of her head. Golly, Barney, where did you get that? I got it from Stig. Oh, you and your Stig, you mean you found it in the dump? I got it from Stig, I tell you, repeated Barney, and you owe me twelve marbles. You needn't have it if you don't want it. And he snatched it away. No, no, please, Barney, let me have it. It's a lovely leopard skin. I'll get you some marbles next time we go into town. Come on, help me try it on. Between them, with the help of pins and strings, they managed to dress Lou in the leopard skin. And once Lou was inside the skin, she wrinkled up her nose and spat. She slunk and clawed. They hunted each other in and out of the bedrooms and along the passages, and on the night of the party, a leopard and a Stone Age hunter made their way along darkening tracks and footpaths. Sometimes the leopard would go ahead and leap out from behind a bush at the hunter. Sometimes the hunter would run on and lie in wait for the leopard. 
One time, when Barney was lying in ambush behind a hollow beech stump, Lou crept up behind him and jumped on him instead of coming along the path and being jumped on. Barney was cross. That's not fair, he complained. It's my turn to do you. But Lou only laughed in a catty sort of way and went bouncing off ahead again. Barney let her go on. He heard Lou's footsteps dying away along the track, and then suddenly there was the snarl and roar she usually gave when she was ambushed. It sounded rather astonished this time. Then he heard Lou's voice. Barney, it was my turn for an ambush. How did you get ahead so quickly? But he hadn't gone ahead. Who was Lou talking to and what was going on? He got up and ran. He found Lou a good distance ahead, crouching down and panting. You did make me jump that time, said Lou. I wasn't expecting you. How did you get there so soon? Get where? asked Barney. Behind that oak tree. I wasn't expecting you, said Lou. But I wasn't behind that oak tree. I was along the path there, said Barney. Oh, don't be silly, Barney. I saw you with my own eyes, said Lou crossly. You must have been there. But I wasn't. Barney protested. How could I have got there? In a different voice, she said, I think we'd better stop playing this game. We'll only be late for the party. Let's just walk on. They went on side by side. The wood was getting really dark now. You know people say they sometimes have a feeling someone's following them, Lou suddenly said in a voice that tried to be bright and ordinary. What about it? said Barney. Oh, nothing, said Lou. I suppose it's not far now to the Forkham Greens, is. But Barney had suddenly had an idea. Lou had seen something behind an oak tree looking like him, and now there was this feeling of being followed. Barney thought he knew what was going on, but Lou didn't, and he laughed softly to himself. I don't see there's anything to laugh at, snapped Lou almost tearfully, and she stamped her foot. They came out at last into the lane, crossed over, and there was the entrance to the Fork and Greens's drive. They could see cars parked outside the house, big ones and little ones, and lights blazed from the windows and from over the front door. Lou's eyes began to sparkle, but now Barney started to feel uncomfortable. He liked parties almost as much as Lou once they'd started, but he felt shy about going up to the big door and ringing the bell. As Lou skipped up the steps and pulled the handle, Barney took a grip of his axe and looked back along the shadowy drive. And yes, he was almost sure something had slipped between two rhododendron bushes. It was what he thought. Someone was lurking behind them. It was Stig. <laughs> The front door opened and Mrs. Forkham Green stood there, looking a little distracted already. Hello! Do come in! she cried. Oh, it's the puma and the caveman. How sweet of you to come and how realistic. She sniffed a little at the animal smell that came in with them. But there was a wail from behind her and she had to turn round to the mass of children of all ages who were hurtling about the big hall or standing dumbly in corners. Oh dear, who is it behind the mask there? Lone Ranger, or is it Zorro? Please don't poke little Bo Peep with your sword, will you, dear? She's only three and she doesn't like it. Lou looked round excitedly at the dressed up children. There were peasant girls and ladies from the Middle Ages, and cowboys, and kings, and queens, and cowboys, and a spaceman who was looking rather hot already, and more cowboys, and Indians, and squaws but she seemed to be the only one in a real animal skin. Barney was looking at the walls of the hall. Look at all those things on the wall, Lou, he whispered. There was hardly a square foot of the wall that wasn't covered with trophies. Heads of gazelles and hearty beast and gnus, bunches of spears and assegais and leather shields, racks of swords and daggers and old guns. This is a super place, murmured Barney. I'm jolly glad we came, aren't you? Mrs. Forkham Green clapped her hands loudly. Now then, children, she called. 
I think we're all here, so we'll start off by dancing Sir Roger de Coverley. I expect you all know it, don't you? The girls do anyway, and they can show the boys. Most of the girls began twittering with pleasure and formed themselves in line ready to begin. But there were glum looks among the boys, and they stood around grasping various weapons. It was going to be that sort of party, was it? Come on, boys, line up. All pistols, tomahawks, ray guns and stone axes on the oak chest, if you please, carolled Mrs Falcon Green as she sat down at a big grand piano. The boys lined up sheepishly and the music began and the girls hopped and skipped and the boys blundered and bumped and everyone was rather glad when the dance came to an end. Mrs Falcon Green had got everything well organised. After the dancing, they had guessing games and acting games and sitting in a ring games, and she just handed out pieces of paper and pencils to anyone who could write and got one of the older girls to do ring a ring of roses with the tinies when all the lights went out. Mm, the fuses, wailed Mrs Falcon Green. One of you older ones get a game going, will you? I won't be long, I hope. And she made her way into the back part of the house. There was a lot of scuffling and squeaking in the dark, only lit by the flickering flames from the big fireplace. Of course, it had to be Lou who thought of something. We'll have a leopard hunt, she said. Give me twenty to get away, and you've all got to hunt me and put me in a cage, all right? There were shouts of agreement. Boys scrambled for their weapons in the dark. Several people counted up to twenty. Everyone shouted coming, and except for a few tiny ones who stayed by the fire, everyone scattered up the stairs and along corridors, whooping and chattering and telling each other to be quiet. Barney was one of the first up the broad staircase and onto the dark landing. Moonlight came in through a leaded window and shone on a figure standing there. He was just going to say something to it when he noticed it was an empty suit of old-fashioned armour. But there was someone coming up the stairs close behind him. He saw the headdress of the Indian chief. Seen the leopard? asked the Indian. No, said Barney. Let's go along here. They went along the corridor, and at the end there was a bare wooden staircase going up and down. Come on up, said the Indian. They climbed the stairs, their feet making quite a noise on the bare boards, and found themselves almost at the top of the house. There was an unlived-in feeling up there. The Indian tried the door of a room, and it opened. There was nothing but boxes and trunks in the room, and there was a big window through which the moonlight came. That leads to the roof, that window, said the Indian. I know, I've been there. Perhaps she's on the roof, the leopard, I mean, said Barney. Might be, said the Indian. He struggled to open the window. They both got through it and out onto a ledge with a parapet. The roof sloped up behind them. They leant over the parapet and looked a long way down to the moonlit lawn. And there, in the middle of the lawn, an animal was crouching. Barney's heart gave a bump, although he knew he was only hunting for his sister. Look, he gasped to his friend, the Indian. There it is, the leopard down there. Crumbs, exclaimed the Indian. Doesn't it look real? Come on, down again quick. They got back in through the window bumped through the box room, clattered down the stairs, and made for the main staircase, calling out, Outside, everybody! The leopard's in the garden! Everybody out! Hunters who'd been crawling under beds and giggling in closets and wardrobes made for the staircase too, and the big door was left open, and they all streamed out into the moonlit garden. In the shrubbery! shouted Barney. Leopard's in the shrubbery! Let's drive it out! Pirates, cowboys and shepherdesses piled into the shrubbery, whooping and crashing. And out of the corner of his eyes, Barney saw something bolt out of the undergrowth and into the shadow of the house. Tally-ho! he hallooed, and sped after it along the gravel path and round the back, past glass houses and outbuildings. He heard running feet behind him. The Indian and some other hunters were on the trail too. In front of him were two big wooden gates, open and leading into a paved stable yard with buildings all round it. In there, he panted, I saw it go. He dashed through the gateway, and at least half a dozen others clattered in with him. Quick, shut the gates. Don't let it get out, he heard the Indian say, and the heavy wooden doors banged to behind him. 
but Barney stood rooted to the pavement, unable to move. The other children behind him were suddenly still and silent too. The boy dressed as the Indian gave a shaky whisper. There's... there's two leopards. The moonlight shone clearly on the roofs of the buildings and the chequered paving of the yard, and clearly in the moonlight, like two figures on a stage, two animal forms crouched, facing each other. Both had golden, black-spotted fur and long tails. But as one of the crouching beasts turned its head to glare at the hunters by the gate, its eyes flashed green and alive in the moonlight, and under the mask of the other beast, Barney recognised the white face of his sister. How long they all stood like that, Barney didn't know. Barney grasping his stone axe, but feeling as if he was turned to stone himself. Lou crouched there, desperately willing her whole body to turn into a real live wild beast to meet this awful peril, and the real live leopard itself, because it couldn't be anything else, frightened by the hullabaloo, mystified by the strange half-beast, half-human that faced it, cornered and angry. It was like a nightmare game when nobody knew what the next move should be. And then Barney heard the Indian behind him give another hoarse whisper. Two cavemen! For out of the shadows at the far end of the yard appeared a figure that might have been his own reflection in a mirror. Shaggy hair, rabbit skins and bare limbs, but this one carried a long spear with a glinting blade and it was levelled at the real leopard. And suddenly Barney's limbs unfroze and he whispered, Stick! The leopard shifted its gaze. It shot a glance at Barney. It looked back at the unmoving Lou. It turned to the advancing stick and gave a low growl. Its tail twitched and it began tucking its feet under it as a cat does when it's about to charge and spring. Stig crouched too, still pointing his spear. And Barney saw that in the shadows beyond Stig was the open door of an empty stable. The leopard had decided which was its most dangerous enemy, and now it kept its eyes on Stig. Barney crept forward behind it. He was almost within axe reach of its twitching tail. The leopard stopped shifting its feet. Its tail lay still for an instant. Its muscles were tense. It sprang, but as it sprang, Barney brought his axe down on the tip of its tail. Lou burst into life with a sudden roar. Stig threw himself sideways, and the startled and confused leopard jumped twice as high and twice as far as it had meant to and vanished into the dark doorway of the stable. Barney hurled himself forward, slammed the lower half of the door shut and then the upper half and gasped, Quick, quick, quick! Somebody bolt it! Lou and the Indian struggled with the bolts and at last they all sank down on the pavement feeling exhausted and weak. The other children had now opened the gates of the yard and the rest of the party were streaming in, chattering and asking questions. Where's the leopard? Have you caught the leopard? Is the game over now? What do you mean it was a real leopard? Let's have another leopard hunt. It was super fun. Why can't we have another leopard hunt? What do you mean the leopard's in the stable? There's the leopard. Two leopards? Well, that's not fair. Nobody told us there were two leopards. Why can't we see the other leopard in the stable? Let's let it out and have another hunt. And the boy in the Zorro suit was actually fumbling with the bolts and trying to open the door of the stable. Stig, who was standing there, wrapped him over the knuckles with the haft of his spear. All right, caveman, said Zorro crossly. I can open the door if I want to. It's not your business. But Stig turned his spear round and threatened him with the point, and Zorro retreated, saying, No need to get lost, eh? Then suddenly all the windows of the big house blazed with light again, and then the voice of Mrs. Forkham Green came from the front steps, calling, Children! Children, you're all to come in at once! Everyone inside as quick as ever you can! She sounded as if she was almost frightened of something. As they all trooped round to the front entrance, they noticed a big truck in the drive and strange men standing around, and some of the men had rifles. Mrs. Forkham Green was standing on the steps, flapping her hands. Come along, come along, she cried. It was so naughty of you to go outside. One, two, three, four, five. Just go in the hall and stand still while I count you all. 
They stood wide-eyed in the hall as Mrs. Falcon Green slammed the big door behind her, leant against it with a white face, counted the guests, and then counted again, and muttered to herself, Oh dear, how many should there be? Little Jonathan couldn't come because of measles, and Betty Strickwell didn't answer. The children began to join in with helpful voices. Where's the other caveman? Yes, there's supposed to be two cavemen. I saw them. And there's two. Please, please be quiet. You'll only confuse me, moaned Mrs. Falcon Green. She turned to a strange man in a raincoat who was standing by the door. I think they're all here, mister, she said. Would you like to explain? Sorry to spoil your party, kiddies said the man. I'm from Bottoms Circus, and I'm afraid one of our animals got loose from its travelling cage, and it must be somewhere about here. But don't worry, we'll soon catch him. There were excited gasps and whistles from the children. Then Lou spoke up. It was a leopard, wasn't it? she said. The man looked at Lou. Yes, girlie, he smiled. Like you! only a bit fiercer. And Barney stepped forward. It's all right, sir, he said. We put it in the stables, me and Stig and Lou. I'll help you get it out if you like. End of side three. Side four. Barney lay awake on his bed. It was hot, and he hung his feet over the edge to cool them down. From outside came the drone of a farm tractor working late, and the barking of dogs from the village. It would be daylight for hours yet, but he had to go to bed in the daylight just because he was only eight. He'd asked his grandmother why he couldn't stay up until it was dark, and she'd explained that today was the longest day and tonight was the shortest night, and that it wouldn't get dark until after ten o'clock, far too late for a boy of eight to stay up. All right, he thought. If it was the shortest night, he wouldn't go to sleep at all. He would see what it was like not to sleep. Barney thought of Stig. I bet he doesn't go to sleep when it's daylight, he thought. And he's how old? Eight? Eighty? Eight hundred? Eight thousand? Thinking of figures made Barney feel drowsy, and before he knew it, he'd gone off to sleep. It was grandmother going to bed that woke him up again. He got out of bed and looked out of the window. At first he thought it was still daytime, but no, the light came from a big white moon in the south, and in the north there was still a bluish light, as if the sun hadn't gone far out of sight behind the elm trees. He'd go out in the moonlight, he'd go and see Stig. He slipped on a pair of shorts and nothing else, and crept carefully out of the bedroom and down the creaking stairs. He pulled at the stiff bolts of the front door. Dinah the spaniel gave a questioning bark. Be quiet, Dinah, whispered Barney crossly. It's only me. If you don't shut up, you'll spoil everything. At last the door swung open. He went out into the moonlight. Everything was very still. Suddenly he jumped as he heard his name called. It was Lou, looking down from her bedroom window. Barney, what are you doing? Lou hissed. Just going out. But it's the middle of the night. I don't care. It's light as day. But where are you going, Barney? Can't I come too? Lou begged. Barney looked at the dark shadows under the fruit trees and thought of how shadowy the pit would be. Perhaps it would be better with two. All right, hurry up then. When Lou appeared at the front of the house, she had Dinah with her. I thought I'd bring Dinah as an extra bodyguard. Where are we going, Barney? I'm going to see Stig. Lou gasped. Really and truly, Barney? Of course. They went through the gate into the paddock. Flash, the old pony, tossed his head and snorted in surprise when he saw them, then went back to his feeding. They crossed the paddock, 
diner running in rings along rabbit trails and came to the edge of the copse. In spite of the strong moonlight, it looked very dark under the trees. They stood still. It was so quiet that they could hear the chiming of a church clock from a long way away. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Midnight, breathed Lou. They walked to the edge of the dark wood together. Then they stopped. How different the moonlight made everything look. They seemed to be standing on the edge of a deep forest, pierced by shadowy glades instead of the straggling copse they knew. Dinah sniffed. The hair on the back of her neck rose up and she barked. Barney felt the hair on his neck rising too. He jumped as the pony came prancing up and snorted behind them and stood looking with pricked ears in the same direction as Dinah. Dinah barked again. Then before their eyes, a great animal leapt into a patch of moonlight in the glade and stood there for a moment. It's a stag, breathed Lou with astonishment. But there aren't any stags here. Dinah was the first to recover, and she hurled herself into the glade, and the stag bounded off into the wood with Dinah in pursuit. It was then that the children went midsummer crazy. Without a word, Lou grabbed the pony by the mane, Barney legged her up on the pony's back, Lou hoisted him up in front, and before they could stop to think, they'd cleared the fence and were galloping straight for the edge of the pit. The pit was there all right. The pony poised on the edge, then with a spring and a scramble, Flash was was down and up the other side. Instead of the great quarry, there was a mere scratch in the ground. And now, nothing was familiar. The thickets and glades stretched on and on. They were reaching the slope which should have led to the lane and Flash slowed down a little. But from far ahead came Dinah's mad yelping and the crashing of undergrowth and the pony needed no urging to pursue the hunt. And still no landmarks came in sight. No open fields, no hedges, no orchards, no farms, only hazel thickets, beech woods and the chalky hillside. The pony went like the wind, and Barney and Lou could only cling there with their bare legs and look with round eyes at the strange landscape. Barney, gasped Lou, we're dreaming all this, really. You may be, I'm not, Barney shouted against the wind. They were galloping up a little valley between clumps of bramble and taller bushes. There was no sound of barking from Dinah. Suddenly, there in the moonlight was the dog lying stretched out on the turf right in front of them. The pony slowed and swerved. The children fell off in a tangle of limbs onto the soft turf that smelt of wild thyme. Of the stag, there was no sign. Lou turned to Barney. If we're not dreaming all this... Where are we? Don't know, replied Barney. Let's go on and maybe we'll see. There was a line of beech trees at the top of the little valley and Barney felt there must be something the other side of them. He scrambled up the slope, went between the dark trunks and beyond them was nothing. It was like flying. Smooth turf sloped down steeply under his feet and far below the land was spread out like a map. Lou, he called, look where we are. They were standing on the edge of the North Downs, a place they knew well enough and the moon made everything as clear as day. There should have been pylons striding over the land carrying electric cables. There should have been squares of orchard, hop gardens, villages and churches and they could see nothing but forest and heath and out of the night strange animal noises came up to them. And in all this stretch of empty land there were only two, no, three, points of light twinkling to show that man was somewhere about. The nearest light was only a little way along the side of the hills and now they could hear human voices coming from it. It's a campfire, said Barney. Come on, let's go and see. But it might be savages or something, said Lou doubtfully. There aren't any savages in England. There aren't any stags in this part of England, but we just saw one, and this doesn't seem to be England at all. Well, it must be somewhere, said Barney. Let's go and ask those people. They went back into the shadow of the beech woods and made their way as quietly as they could over last year's crackling leaves and husks. Barney, I wish we had a lead. Dinah might give us away. 
I've got some string in my pocket, said Barney. He found a coil of hairy string and they tied it to Dinah's collar. Soon the sounds of the camp were quite near and they could see the red firelight flickering through the black beech trunks. Sounds as if they're having a party, said Lou. Listen, music. As they reached the last beech tree of the wood, a giant with thick roots coiling into the chalky soil and broad boughs spreading out towards the slope on which the camp stood, Barney started scrambling onto one of the spreading branches. I'm going to climb this tree so I can see. So am I, then. What about Dinah? I'll tie her up here, said Lou. Lie down, Dinah. Be quiet, there's a good dog. They climbed from limb to limb of the great beech tree until they got to a thick bough that grew out straight towards the firelight. They had a perfect view of the camp. Or was it a camp? There were beehive huts made of poles planted in the ground, tied together at the top and thatched with straw and rushes. In an open space, there was quite a crowd of people gathered round the fire. None of them seemed to be wearing much more than Lou and Barney. All of them seemed to have a lot of wild black hair, except for a few grey and white heads. The older ones were sitting, lying or squatting around. Toddlers were tumbling or sleeping in the dust. Boys and girls were chasing each other or teasing fierce-looking dogs. The music came from a group in the middle of the crowd near the fire. One was holding half the jawbone of a large animal and running another longer bone up and down the teeth, making a scratchy rhythm. Another had a hollow log, which was hitting with two wooden clubs. The third was the singer. The children couldn't understand the words, but it was quite clear what the song was about. One moment the singer was a deer, grazing peacefully, and then looking anxiously about. Then he was a hunter, stalking his prey with spear poised. The crowd became as excited as the singer and joined in with hand claps and cries. But there was yet another sound which the listeners couldn't quite understand. A kind of blong, 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 blong. Not always on one note as most of the singing was, and not really taking much notice of the rhythm of the log drum and jawbone. Then the bone scraper joined the singer in a little shuffle dance, and the children could see the fourth member of the band. On the ground was a large hollow animal skull with great curving horns. Tied between the horns were three or four lengths of string or gut, and a small dark figure was squatting by this simple harp, plucking at the strings, taking very little notice of anyone else. In fact, the song came to an end. The drummer gave the final thump to his log, the bone scraper rattled to a stop, but the little harpist went on with his three notes as if he were the only musician in the world. Some of the crowd began to laugh and jeer at him as he played away, but it wasn't until someone threw a meat bone catching him on the head that the player looked up, as if surprised to see that he wasn't alone. Barney nearly fell off his branch. It's Stig! Hush, Barney! Lou hissed. You'll give us away. But it's Stig, said Barney excitedly. Where's he going now? For the little figure was rather sulkily walking away from the campfire towards the trees. He's coming this way, whispered Lou. Barney, you're not to give us away. Why not? He's my friend. What about all the others? Who are they? You never said about them. I don't know who they are. I never saw them before. What gave them away was Dinah tied up at the bottom of the tree. She began to growl and then to give short, sharp barks. On the edge of the bushes, Stig froze into stillness. Some of the wild children playing on the outside of the crowd heard her too. The bolder ones ran to the edge of the wood, the little ones ran to their parents. Soon a number of alarmed elders, snatching up spears and clubs, were making for the sound of Dinah's bark. Lou and Barney clung to their high branch like squirrels, not daring to move. Dinah's barking became more and more frantic as she heard the rustling of bodies through the bushes. Under cover of the noise, Barney whispered, Lou, we've got to escape. Look where that bough goes. The limb they were on stuck out into nothingness, but one of its branches went across to another long limb, and this one stretched out and rubbed shoulders with another great beech tree. If they climbed over into the other tree, Barney thought they could escape. Come on, while they're making all this noise. Oh, Barney, we can't, and they'll find Dinah anyhow. 
I'm going to try, then perhaps we can rescue Dinah. He inched himself backwards until he reached the branch that grew crosswise. It was too thin to sit astride, so he decided to hang underneath it like a sloth by his hands and legs. Upside down like this, he crawled through the empty air between the two big limbs. By bending his head right back, he had an upside down view of the floor of the forest patched with moonlight, and right beneath him was a wild hunter. The tip of his spear pointing skywards, but looking at the ground. Barney hung without moving until the man had passed on, then moved as quickly and as quietly as he could to where the branch passed over the other great limb. Here he got himself right way up on the bow again. His heart was thumping and his legs felt quivery, but at least he was safer. But now he had to go outward to where the two trees shook hands high in the air. As he went, the boughs became thinner and swayed more. At last he was where the trees met. Where the branches crossed, their movement had rubbed a great dry scar, and nothing he could do would stop a loud creak coming from this rubbing place every time he moved. As quickly as he dared, he turned round so as to go backward down the new branch, let go the branch he had just come up, and... crack! Barney crashed to the forest floor. There was a rustle of leaves, and he could see Lou clambering down towards him. She fell off the last low bough and ran to where he was lying. Barney, are you all right? He sat up. Of course I'm all right, he said. Bit scratched, that's all. Shadowy figures were moving towards them through the wood. One of them, with tousled head, skin skirt and flint spear, came into the moonlight patch. Lou drew away from it, but Barney knew who it was. Hello, Stig. What are you doing here? Stig's teeth flashed in the moonlight, and then he looked curiously at Lou. Oh, this is only my sister, Stig, said Barney. Is this really Stig? whispered Lou. Yes, of course, my friend Stig. Oh, said Lou. Um, good evening, Mr. Stig. Stig merely grinned and said nothing. Other figures had appeared from the shadows and were standing round in a circle watching them. Stig made a few strange sounds and they lowered their weapons. Then an argument broke out, with a lot of waving of arms towards the camp and pointing of fingers at Barney and Lou. Finally, Stig smiled at them, held out his two hands to them, and made ushering movements. I think we're invited to the party, said Barney. They moved off through the wood, and there in the dark was Dinah, jumping around on the end of her string. Lou ran up to her. It's all right, Dinah. It's only Barney's friend Stig and the other nice gentleman. Dinah didn't seem at all too sure about the other nice gentleman and stood there growling in her throat until Stig came up and said something and she actually licked his hand. That's funny, Lou whispered. Dinah seems to know Stig. Probably meets him when she goes rabbiting, said Barney. Soon they came out from the wood and the women and bigger children who hadn't dared go into the dark wood ran up to stare at them. I don't suppose they've ever seen anything like us. Lou whispered. Barney took a look at Lou in the bright moonlight. Well, I don't know, he said. You can't see yourself, Lou. You don't look much different from them except your hair's fair. Lou felt her tangled hair and looked at her ripped shorts, then looked at Barney with his legs all smeared with green from the bark of the trees. You do look very different yourself, she said. As they came near the huts, Lou said, I thought Stigs were cavemen. What have they got huts for? Perhaps they're cavemen on holiday, he said. There was a holiday feeling about the tribe. They were sitting round the fires, from which there came smells of roasting meat. Barney looked at a group of boys who were rolling and wrestling on the ground and whispered, Do you think we're allowed to play with them? Better not, Lou whispered back. We'll have to say how do you do to whoever's giving the party first, anyhow. They passed into the circle of firelight, and the crowd fell silent. On the other side of the circle was a group of older men, and in the middle there was a figure sitting on a tree trunk. He had white hair, very bright black eyes, and was dressed in some very silky fur with necklaces and bangles of animal's teeth. They didn't need to be told that this was the chief. Suddenly, all the rest of the party fell flat on the ground. Lou, what happened? he whispered. They all fell down. Then he saw that Lou was trying to curtsy, which looked a bit silly with bare legs and torn shorts, 
and he thought it might be good manners to bow. The chief, or whoever it was, seemed satisfied with his touch-the-toes bend and lose contortions, and a smile appeared on his face. In fact, Barney thought he was going to laugh, but then the chief looked stern again and barked a short question at Stig, who had now stood up again. And Stig began to speak. Barney thought of all the time he'd spent with Stig, when they'd hardly said a word to each other, though they'd understood each other well enough, and here he was making a speech like somebody on the wireless. It sounded wonderful, but he didn't understand a word of it. What's he saying? whispered Lou. He's saying how we came here, said Barney. Well, how did we? Lou whispered again. You know, said Barney. I jolly well don't know, said Lou quite crossly. That's why I want to know what he's saying. It would be interesting, thought Barney, as the speech went on and on. At one point, Stig would wave his spear towards the North Star. At another, he would thump himself over the heart and slap Barney on the back. He's saying I'm his friend, said Barney. Stig stopped. There was a silence, as the chief seemed to think for a while. Then he rose to his feet. He spoke in a strong, majestic voice, turning his head first to Lou and Barney, then to one side of the assembled tribe, and then to the other. He raised his arms to the stars, waved his hand at the moon, placed both hands over his heart, and then seemed to be blessing the children and the rest of the tribe. I think he's friendly too, whispered Barney. The chief smiled at them and waved them to sit down near him. Then he looked at Dinah. He motioned to Lou to bring this strange, tame animal to him, and Lou led the dog up and said, Shake hands with the nice chief, Dinah. Dinah didn't feel like raising a paw, but the chief gently stroked her back and ears, then ran his hand over the skin he was wearing and said something in his strange language. He's saying what a nice coat Dinah's got, said Lou, pleased. Probably saying what a nice coat it would make for him, said Barney, but Lou just said, Oh, Barney, don't, and pulled Dinah to her side. They sat at the side of the royal party and waited, and they had a strange feeling that everyone else was waiting too. Sometimes everyone stopped talking altogether and just listened, and the chief seemed to have his eyes fixed on the mists at the bottom of the valley. A man came from the back of the crowd carrying two bull's horns, which he offered to Barney and Lou. Barney took his. It was full of some liquid. They looked at the chief and the old men and saw that they were holding horns too. Then the chief lifted his to his mouth, drank what was in it at one swig and threw the horn over his shoulder. It's to drink, said Barney. And they both realised they were thirsty and both took a deep swallow from the horns. Then they both made the same face. Blech. Lou spluttered. Beer! Barney just threw his full horn over his shoulder. A rather fat, sleepy tribesman sitting behind him got most of the beer in his face. He didn't mind very much as he licked the drops running down his nose. Lou got rid of hers much more carefully. Now the food was coming round. Men came running with smoking joints, which they handed first to the chief, and then to the other important men and to the children. The smell had been delicious, but when they looked at the stringy blackened meat on the bones they'd been handed, they didn't feel so hungry. Do you think it'll be bad manners if we don't eat it? Lou said doubtfully. Perhaps they don't have manners, said Barney. It can't be good manners to throw your cup over your shoulder. The chief did it, so it must be, said Lou. You can't tell with manners. They looked at the chief again. He'd gnawed the meat off his bone in no time, and now he flung it backwards to the rear of the crowd, where it was seized by one of the pack of wildish dogs that were waiting around. Oh, well, that's easy, said Lou. Here you are, Dinah, nice bone with meat on. Barney also handed his piece to the dog, and Dinah gnawed away happily like the rest of the tribe. At last the champing jaws died away, fingers were wiped on the grass or in the hair, and the tribe settled down again with their air of waiting. Barney, who was lying back on the soft turf, heard it first. What's that? he exclaimed, sitting up suddenly. Something in the ground. Now that he was sitting up, he couldn't hear it. He lay down again and put his ear to the ground. The sound came again, a sort of thumping. He made Lou put her head to the ground, and for a time they heard nothing and then the thump came again. 
By now there was a shushing among the crowd, and after a time the sound could be heard through the air, as well as being a shake in the hillside. There was a long time between thumps. Barney counted up to twenty quite slowly. It could have been the footsteps of some great giant or monster plodding unhurriedly towards them. Then Barney caught another sound that went with the thumps of the footsteps. Before each thump, there was a sort of long-drawn wail, and each time the whole chalky hill shook until they could feel it in their bones. Everyone had heard it now, and the circle of tribesmen round the fire was breaking up. Everyone was moving towards the edge of the steep slope that plunged down to the valley. They got up and ran with the others. At the bottom of the valley, the forest stretched away to the distant hills under the moonlight, and blankets of low mist lay, with the trees poking their heads through them. They strained their eyes to see through the mist where the sound seemed to be coming from. Then Lou gasped and clutched Barney's arm. Look, she breathed. There it is. Out of the mist, there heaved itself a dark shape that stood up for a moment and then each time fell forward in their direction. And every time it appeared, there came this wail, followed by the earth-shaking thump. And the sound seemed to be not one loud voice, but many voices. And then Barney could see that the dark shape had sort of strings joined to it. Lou said, Barney, I'm going to pinch myself and then I'll wake up. Don't you dare wake up and leave me here, said Barney. Will you pinch yourself at the same time, said Lou. They pinched themselves. Nothing happened. Are you awake? Barney asked. No, replied Lou. Look said Barney. We can't both be dreaming the same dream, so we must be both awake. I wish we weren't. He took his eyes off the thing and turned to someone standing next to him. It was Stig. Stig, what is it? And what's going to happen? Stig just looked at him in his usual not understanding way. But he grinned, and he really seemed not at all worried. Lou, Stig seems to think it's all right. Does he? said Lou, looking round. Well, perhaps it's a tame thing, or a usual thing, anyhow. They felt better with Stig standing so cheerfully beside them. But Dinah suddenly decided that it was a thing she didn't like at all, turned tail, jerked the string from Lou's hand, and bolted with Lou after her, shouting, Dinah, Dinah, come back! And at the same time, Stig made a come-on wave to Barney and some of the other men and started running down the steep slope. This mist was the sort that wasn't there when you got to it, but spread the moonlight around like daylight. And Barney was still running down the last bit of hill when he could see quite plainly what it all was. The dark shape, the strings, the wail, and the grunt, and the thump. leading along the base of the hill was a crowd of tribesmen. They were divided into two groups. Those nearer to him were pulling on ropes, those further away were working long poles, and the thing they were manhandling was a great rough slab of dark rock, at least twice as high as the tallest man. And this was the way they were heaving it along. The slab of rock was lying flat on the ground. Twelve men with pointed stakes pushed them under the edge of the rock and levered it about a foot off the ground. A much larger group of men pushed much longer poles under the rock as far as they would go and lifted it still higher by pushing upwards on the poles. To the top ends of these poles, long ropes of twisted hide had been tied, which passed over the top of the rock to the men in front. When the rock was high enough, the men in front pulled all together on the ropes. The rock rose until it was standing upright, seemed to stop there for a second, and then fell forward with a mighty thump that they'd heard on the top of the hill. And the voice of the monster was the heave-ho of the men as they heaved together on the levers and ropes and grunted together at the difficult point when the rock was halfway to standing up. 
Barney was almost disappointed, but there was no time to stand around. The job was now to get the rock up the hill, and all the new helpers from the camp were needed. Without a pause in the slow footsteps of the rock, they joined in the work. Or rather, it was like joining in a game or a dance. Barney grabbed the end of a rope behind Stig and watched what he did. They faced the stone and had to walk towards it, while the men the other side lifted the poles back to fit them again under the rock. Then they had to take up the slack, but not pull until the rock was lifted to the halfway mark. Then all together, with the men on the other two ropes, they had to take the strain, heave on the rope until the rock was standing upright, and then heave no more, because it was no use pulling the rock over towards them, it could fall by itself. Barney soon found it tiring, and wondered how long they could keep going like that. He started to say, wouldn't it be better if... But as soon as he started talking, Stig trod on his toe. He noticed then that nobody was making suggestions, nobody was arguing, nobody was even giving orders. They just sang their wailing song, pulled together, walked up a few steps together, rested together while the pole pushers worked. And Barney began to see that they could keep this up for hundreds of miles, and they probably had, because he couldn't think where they could find slabs of rock like this anywhere near. Of course, they couldn't go straight up the hill, it was too steep, but there was a grassy track slanting along the hillside, and up it they slowly humped the great rock. The women and children ran out to meet them and shout encouragement. Barney heard a voice he recognised and saw Lou among them holding an excited diner. "'What are you going to do with it, Barney?' she was saying. "'I can't help, cos I can't leave diner.' But as soon as he paid attention to what Lou was saying, he got trodden on and jerked again, so he gave up trying to hear what she was shouting. He thought he heard her say, wouldn't it be better if you had wheels? But there didn't seem to be much he could do about it. Now, although it was the steepest part of the track, they seemed to be going quicker. Barney looked round and saw the chief standing there alongside the track. Then he thought of Lou's question, and for the first time wondered what they were going to do with this lump of rock. With the last couple of quick heaves, they laid the rock almost at the feet of the king. One man said something short in a loud voice, and all the rope men and pole men fell on their faces towards the king. Barney did too this time, he was too tired to do anything else. The king raised his arm. Barney sat up and saw that leading away from where the rock lay was a sort of raised mound. This end of it was level with the ground, but the far end ran out to the tops of three other huge stones that were standing upright lower down the hillside. Barney thought he could see what they had brought the slab all the way up the hill for. If they humped it along this mound, they could put it so that it rested on top of the three standing stones, and there it would be. A house for the king, or a temple, or whatever it was that people put big stones across the top of others for. It seemed a grand idea to Barney. He could see now that it wasn't going to be the same as bringing it along the track. Now it was going downhill. If they weren't careful, it could go bounding away down the slope and even knock the standing stones flying like a lot of skittles. The king seemed to be pointing to the eastern sky with one hand and urging them on with the other. Barney looked towards where the king was pointing. Was the sky beginning to get light? Was it nearly morning? Was there something that had to be done before the night came to an end? Before the end of the shortest night? The night that seemed to have been going on for such a long time? The women and children scrambled down the hill to get a good view of the standing stones. The men with the poles and ropes made ready again. This time, because of the steepness of the slope, they couldn't pull from the front, but had to do all the lifting and pushing from behind. And to stop the stone running away down the hill, there was a rope leading uphill behind it, with a lot of people hanging on to it to act as a break. Stig took hold near the end of this, and Barney attached himself last of all, as anchor man. There was no hearty heave-hoeing this time, it was easy enough to lift the rock on edge, but then everybody watched anxiously as the break rope was paid out and the rock was allowed to sink gently forward. There was no loud thump either, but a lot of hissing of breath and sighs of relief as each turnover was safely done. The steps along the top of the mound were even more anxious. One mistake and the stone could topple sideways and charge off downhill but they made six steps safely along the mound, each time letting the stone settle gently down by the break rope. And now 
It was standing on its edge, ready to be lowered onto the top of the standing stones. The king was looking anxiously at the sky, which now showed a bright glow over the shoulders of the downs to the east. Sunrise couldn't be far off. The workers on the brake rope took the strain as the stone began to fall forward. But what was this? Dinah scrambling up the mound straight in front of the toppling stone, with Lou in desperate pursuit, and then Lou's voice shouting, Stop! Stop! Don't let it down! There's a baby! And there was Lou disappearing in front of the stone too. The stone was moving. Everyone on the brake rope was doing his best to hold it back, but once it had started, it was almost impossible. Barney dug his heels into the slippery turf, but he could feel himself being dragged slowly forward. And then he saw, just beside him on the hillside, a scrubby thorn tree, weather-beaten and stunted, but with strong roots clutching the earth. Stig, he gasped, the tree! Stig looked round and saw. With one hairy arm, Stig reached out and grabbed the trunk. The rope was wrapped around his other wrist, and his bones seemed to crackle as his arms took the strain, but the brake rope stopped moving forward. Trying not to fumble, Barney passed the end of the rope twice round the little tree and pulled it taut, and Stig grinned as he saw that he could let go. The hide rope stretched, the roots of the tree strained in the ground, but Barney let himself look at the stone and saw that it wasn't moving. And then Lou appeared from under the tilted stone, followed by Dinah, and carrying a naked, black-haired stig baby. The king shouted impatiently. Barney let the end of the rope run out round the tree trunk. The great slab fell forward with a hollow sound onto the tops of the standing stones and... And over the shoulder of the downs appeared a red spark. And the valley was flooded with light. It was sunrise. From the low mist in the bottom of the valley appeared the spire of a church, the tops of oast houses, and electricity pylons. The solid forest was gone, and there were the squares of cornfield, orchard and hop garden. There were the villages, and the distant chimneys of cement works, and the broad ribbon of the main road sweeping down the hill below. Barney looked round the hillside. The people of the tribe had disappeared. There were no huts, no sign of a campfire. They'd all vanished with the last shades of darkness. But one thing hadn't changed. The three stones with the great slab on top were still before his eyes, weathered now, with grey lichen growing on them. The mound wasn't there, but the stones stood just as they'd done when he had let go the last of the rope. Sitting against them was Lou, blinking her eyes at the rising sun as if she was waking from a deep sleep and holding Dinah in her arms. Oh, Barney, I've had such a funny dream, said Lou sleepily. I'm glad I've woken up, though. Are you sure we've woken up? said Barney. Lou looked round. Well, I dreamt about a tribe of people long ago. They've all gone and now it's now, so it must have been a dream. What are we doing here, then? asked Barney. Lou opened her eyes at that. Good gracious, she said. We don't usually wake up on top of a hill, do we? She shut her eyes. I'm going to dream myself back to bed she said firmly. Barney shook her. Get up, Lou. It isn't that sort of dream at all. We really are here. We've got to get back to Granny's somehow. Barney knew that it was something more than a dream. The tiredness in his arms and legs told him that he really had been hauling the great stone that looked as if it had been there for thousands of years. He walked round to the front of the stones where the open side looked over the valley, and there... Sitting in the entrance, as if he was on his own front porch, was Stig. Barney gaped, and Stig grinned. Lou put her head round the stone and gasped too. Stig! she exclaimed. What are you doing here? If you're a midsummer fairy, or whatever the others were, you're supposed to vanish too. But I told you, said Barney. Stig's always here. He's my friend. Barney and Lou have almost forgotten how they got back to the house that summer morning. They remember catching the pony, 
who was grazing peacefully on the hilltop and riding back half asleep clitter-clatter through the empty lanes with Stig walking beside them, and they remember falling into their beds and waking very late on Midsummer Day. Probably they agreed on the way back not to say anything about what had happened. Anyhow, what could they say? It wasn't until quite a long time later that they went with their parents for a picnic on the North Downs where the four stones stand. And as they ate their sandwiches, their parents got into an argument about Stone Ages and Bronze Ages and about how the stones had got there at all, until Barney said without thinking, they had flint spears and it was the heave-ho that did it. And everyone thought about this quite a lot and had to admit that Barney was probably right, that they couldn't think how he knew. And then Barney and Lou said together, but I wonder how the baby got there. And that was a question nobody could answer. And what about Stig? Well, if you ask Barney, he'll say in an offhand manner that he's still living in the dump. The grown-ups never really knew just how real he was, but they got used to the idea that wherever there was a pile of old thrown-away things, an unseen Stig was likely to be poking around in it. And whenever there was a particularly odd job to be done, like making sure a rainwater butt didn't spring a leak when it was empty and overflow when it was full, or a new tool for lifting parsnips, then someone would say, let's get Stig to fix it. Actually, the dump's filling up fast now and Stig may be on the move. One report was that he'd been seen working at a garage by the main road, where they collect old wrecked cars and put the pieces in rusty piles. And somebody else said he saw him in a back lane of that woody country at the top of the downs, mending a chicken run with an old wire mattress. It certainly sounded like Barney's friend Stig. But perhaps it was only a relative of his. <laughs>